this is Cleopatra, a pharaoh, ruler of Egypt. But who was she really? Too much focus on her sexuality, too much on her lovers, not enough about the real Cleopatra. Coming to Berlin in Germany, we can come face to face with this mysterious woman. Here at the Altus Museum in Berlin, in Germany, they have some of the most amazing Greek art, and they have something that I've really been looking forward to see, a bust believed to be Cleopatra. There is so much myth around her. Cleopatra's story has changed and evolved over the years so much that we get lost when looking for the real facts surrounding her. What we're looking at here is a statue from a private villa in Rome. And this is a bust believed to be Cleopatra, Cleopatra VII, the final pharaoh of Egypt. She is identified as Cleopatra because she was discovered next to a statue of Julius Caesar. She does resemble the images we have of Cleopatra on coin form. And what's interesting, the images of Cleopatra on the coin form show her wearing this band across her head, the waved hair on the side, and a little bun at the back of her neck. So this very well could be the face of the Cleopatra. A woman who tried to save Egypt, a political figure, and an incredibly tactile ruler. A figure whose name and legacy is burned into the minds of billions, coming from a tenacious Greek Macedonian family. She had to fight and even kill for her place on the throne. A noble attempt to save a failing Egypt. Cleopatra was willing to do anything to retain Egypt. She bore children from two of ancient Rome's most powerful men. She was a writer, an inventor, a scholar. Thousands of years later, we're still talking either about the men in her life or what she looked like rather than her accomplishments. She left her mark during the final days of ancient Egypt. The seventh queen in her family to be named Cleopatra. Let us see if Cleopatra was black or not. Her story has been warped so much throughout history. From biased opinions to praise, yet who was she really? The heir to the throne had to be of pure Macedonian Greek uh, blood. Keep her dignity protected. Everyone thinks they know her. Everyone has a different opinion. But most of those are modern, based on films and misinformed playwrights. This is the reason why I've been searching for Cleopatra's tomb. I believe she deserved to be found. How much do we rarely know about the true Cleopatra? <laughs> to learn about Cleopatra, we must go back a few hundred years to how her family actually arrived in Egypt. The year was 332 BC. Egypt had been taken over by the Persians, who had made life for the population of Egypt quite uncomfortable. However, Egypt's salvation was on the horizon. A power was rising up against the Persians. This power 
was based in northern Greece, known as Macedonia. His name was Alexandros, or as we know him, Alexander the Great. He wanted what the Persians had. He wanted to take over their expanding empire as it was making advances towards Macedonia. Alexander arrived in Egypt and chased Darius and the Persians out. Egypt and Greece had good relations for hundreds of years prior. Ramses II and Nefertari had good ties to Greece, though one Egyptian pharaoh in particular, named Amasis in Greek, or Achmos II, who reigned around 550 BC, had made allies even more with regions of Greece, and even sent 1,000 talents of gold to help rebuild the Temple of Delphi after it was burned down. He also married a Greek princess, Landishi. It is thought that it is these good relations between the two countries that was the reason why the Egyptians welcomed the Macedonian Greek Alexander into Egypt with open arms uncontested. He was then crowned pharaoh and named as the son of the god Amun. However, some suggest that a mythical tale imagined in around 150 BC tells us that the last Egyptian-born pharaoh, Nectanebo, had not fled south from the Persian invaders, but rather north into Greece, where he disguised himself as the god Amun and impregnated the mother of Alexander, thus conceiving Alexander the Great. This story is merely a myth and holds no historic merit, though some say that it was because of this tale that the Egyptians welcomed Alexander. Alexander adopted Egyptian custom, representing himself as a pharaoh, a title that he was most proud of. Alexander only stayed in Egypt a few months, founding the new capital city named Alexandria on the Egyptian Mediterranean, and building several small additions to existing Egyptian temples. He left Egypt, went to Persia, and beyond. When Alexander returned to Babylon in 323 BC, he mysteriously fell ill, and shortly died after entering the city. With his recognized son not yet born, the rulership of Alexander's empire was split up between his courtiers. The half-brother of Alexander ruled Egypt for a few years, with the then infant son of Alexander named after his father, being only a figurehead and not a real pharaoh. Alexander IV was killed at age 13, and shortly after, another illegitimate son of Alexander the Great was also written out of the story. Other Macedonians made attempts to conquer Egypt, but it was Ptolemy I who was crowned as pharaoh from Cyprus. Ptolemy I, he was Macedonian Greek, but after him, he starts getting messy and confusing. And this is because brothers were marrying sisters, uncles were marrying nieces, and fathers were marrying their stepdaughters. And in between these marriage unions, they were also killing each other. Ptolemy I was an army general of Alexander and his personal bodyguard and showed great support for the followers of Alexander who defended Egypt and some vague historical accounts mention Ptolemy was a cousin or even a half-brother of Alexander. Thus, Ptolemy became Pharaoh of Egypt and founded the Ptolemaic dynasty, the family 
that gave us Cleopatra the Seventh. To add further to the confusion, the men were all called Ptolemy, and the women were either Arsinoe, Berenike, or Cleopatra. So our Cleopatra is actually Cleopatra the Seventh. Many years later, after the start of the Ptolemaic dynasty, their final pharaoh was about to emerge. Cleopatra's family tree is very complicated. In fact, to say it's complicated is an understatement. It's like navigating your way through a complex maze full of twists and turns and dead ends. And when you finally make it to the end, you're more confused and wonder how you got there. The year was 69 BC. Cleopatra VII was born. She was set to become the most revered of all the Cleopatras. A very ambitious queen, a very intelligent queen, that she did learn languages, was amazing. In that time, only men can go to study. Cleopatra was formally educated, most likely at the great learning center known as the Museum. Cleopatra was the first of the Ptolemaic ruler who speak Egyptian. She was born in Alexandria, Egypt, the only Ptolemaic ruler who learned and spoke the Egyptian language. So for me, in a way or another, she was an Egyptian queen. To me as an Egyptian, this is how I see Cleopatra. Cleopatra, she was a unique person and she wrote the hieroglyphs, by the way. And Cleopatra, uh, she spoke, for example, Aramic, Hebrew, ancient Egyptian language, uh, Greek, uh, Latin, uh, and she cared about all the kind of knowledge, astronomy, philosophy of uh, ancient uh, Greece and ancient Egypt, and also uh, the religion of ancient Egypt. She knows all the gods you have like large knowledge uh, about ancient Egypt and the lady she has a dig she had a dignity. Cleopatra had the best education available. During the Ptolemaic period, Alexandria became the cultural hub of learning and it all began with the vision of Ptolemy the First. He wanted to amass education and knowledge from all over the world and have it in one place and I think he got really close to achieving this. Alexandria attracted scholars from all over the world, some of the greatest minds ever. And during its peak, the Alexandrian library amassed about half a million books. Every time a ship would come to the Alexandrian harbor, if there were any books on board, they would take these books, get them copied, and then return them back to the owner. Egypt, apart from grain, also controlled the paper trade, so they became the greatest exporters of books. There was a whole institutional complex where they, would, they could gather and some of the greatest mind would share their ideas. The Ptolemies wanted to make sure that they stayed there, so they gave them great living standards. So this is the social, educational, environment in which Cleopatra grew up and she thrived in this environment and excelled and I think she was a bit of a child prodigy and her father Ptolemy XII saw something special in her from a very young age and he therefore trained her to become the next pharaoh. He trained her to become fantastic at public speaking and she managed to learn nine languages that's remarkable. And Plutarch tells us that she flowed from one language to another with ease and she spoke them beautifully, which makes me think that she learned these languages from a very young age. And not only did she excel in languages, she would have learned literature, astronomy, mathematics. And it looks like she had an interest in medicine as well because there are some medical treatises which are assigned to her in dermatology. So she was a very exceptional, intelligent woman. Cleopatra's parentage is widely disputed. Many ancient sources have various opinions. Her father, Ptolemy XII, Uletis, was the son of Pharaoh Ptolemy IX. 
Oleti's mother is disputed. Cleopatra Selene is suggested, as it is known that she bore two children. His second wife, Cleopatra the Fourth, is a candidate, but it is not certain. The ancient writer, around 100 BC, Pompeius Trogus, has referred to Ptolemy Uletes as the bastard son, while Cicero makes mention of a half Greek, half Syrian consort being the mother of Uletes. This would make sense as Uletes spent most of his life in and around Syria. He wasn't that popular with Romans. They didn't really, they, they held a lot of um, abuse his way. One of the insults that the Romans particularly enjoyed was to call him the illegitimate. Now, I've toned it down, but they said this quite a lot. Cleopatra the first was actually born in Syria. She was the daughter of the Seleucid king. Her mother was Greek and Persian, and she married Ptolemy V. Now, Ptolemy V's claim to fame is the Rosetta Stone, which, of course, is responsible for the decipherment of the ancient Egyptian language. So on this stone, he basically lists all his accomplishments, all the good deeds he did. He's basically letting us know that he was a great guy. And him and Cleopatra the first have a daughter, and this is now Cleopatra the second. But Cleopatra the second goes a step further in that she marries both her brothers. So first she marries Ptolemy the sixth, and then when he dies, she marries Ptolemy the eighth. She has children from both her husbands. One of her daughters is Cleopatra the third. We're on to the third now. Cleopatra the third ends up marrying her uncle and stepfather Ptolemy the eighth. And by this stage, Ptolemy the eighth is married to mother and daughter. I, it gets very confusing. And then Cleopatra the third, she has a daughter who is Cleopatra the fourth. Cleopatra the fourth is killed off by one of her sisters. And then we've got Cleopatra the fifth and sixth, who are a little bit more obscure. The Ptolemaic dynasty never conceived out of their own bloodlines. A noble foreign woman would have been looked down upon, but ultimately seen as passable. Cleopatra the seventh's mother is also a matter of theory and opinion. Two women are strong possible candidates. Cleopatra V, also known as Trifania, was the sister and wife of Ptolemy the Twelfth, Uletis. When they were married, a papyrus mentions their joint titles as Theo Philipatros Kai Philadelphoi, which means of the father brother and sister, the loving gods. She is also mentioned at two temples in Egypt, at Philae and at Edfu Temple, where she is called the daughter of the sun, mistress of the two lands, and female ruler. It is highly probable that her mother is the same woman as her brother. Cleopatra V, her father was probably Ptolemy the Ninth or Ptolemy the Tenth, but she's believed to have married Ptolemy the Twelfth, who is Cleopatra the Seventh's father. Cleopatra V disappears from the records shortly after Cleopatra the Seventh is born. So it could be that she died in childbirth. It could be that she was exiled. Well, perhaps she just didn't do anything that remarkable to be written about. In 305 AD, the philosopher Porfiry talks about Cleopatra V dying in 69 BC during childbirth. This would have been the birth of Cleopatra VII. 
he goes on to mention that a daughter sharing the same name went on as co-regent while the father of the great Cleopatra was exiled to Rome. Strabo's account contradicts this, saying that Cleopatra V was the one who co-ruled with her daughter Berenice while Ptolemy was exiled to Rome. Other texts suggest Cleopatra as having a half-Greek, half-Egyptian mother who was a priestess of Ptah. Others suggest her mother was a half-Greek, half-Syrian woman that her father had known. Neither of these two women can be confirmed to having ever existed. Do you think that it would have been okay for them to have concubines because they were so, so focused on keeping the bloodline within the family? The, the inbreeding was uh, off the hook. I mean, Tutankhamun was also a victim of... Uh, Completely inbreeding. inbreeding. Do you think they were allowed to have concubines? No, I'm, 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 I'm not aware of it. And I'm, um, what, I, I am, what I, I am aware of is that always the, the heir to the throne had to be of pure uh, Macedonian Greek uh, blood. Yeah. So even if they had concubines on the side, the children of these concubines probably got nowhere in life. If her mother was an Alexandrian priestess, I don't think Cleopatra would have been, would have had the access to the throne. The Syrian mother theory holds more bounds, since this is where Cleopatra fled to after conflicts with her brother. Yet the candidate of the wife of Ptolemy Oletis, known as Cleopatra V, is more likely considering the amount of inbreeding to keep the bloodlines pure. So if Cleopatra was illegitimate, the Romans would have been shouting this from the rooftops because the Romans that are responsible for her history are Romans that either detested her or had their own biases or their own agenda. And there isn't a single writer that says she was illegitimate, which means that she must have been born to Ptolemy the Twelfth's wife. So the only wife that we really know of is clip out of the fifth. If her mother had died in childbirth, then why should there be any mention of her? If her mother did oust her father and herself to Rome, why would there be any mention of her as a disgraced member of the family who turned on her own relations, as was a custom of the Ptolemaic rulers? Let us see if Cleopatra was black or not. The big uh, question. <laughs> you know what I'm going to say? First of all, I'm not against the black at all. But I would like to give facts about Cleopatra. Because look at the Macedonian queens and Macedonian princesses. There is no one who was really black. At the same time, Look at all the statues that was made for Cleopatra. At least I know about two statues for Cleopatra. And all the coins that I discovered inside with Catherine Martinez, the temple of Betuziris Magna, it do does not show at all that Cleopatra was black. And I want to come to a very important point. It is not good to change history. It is not good to make a false history. Again, I am not against the black at all. If Egypt history was black, I will say that. But let us see if you, anyone will come and look at the scenes that shown on the temples of the new kingdom and the old kingdom and the middle kingdom. You always see the king smiting the enemies of Egypt. And the enemies of Egypt were actually Asiatics, African, and Libyan. Then we have five people in front of him. If you look at the face of the king and the face of the other enemies of Egypt, there is no one can say that the Egyptians were black at all.
showed themselves as unique, as yes. Egyptians. The Egyptians were unique and they were different. We know in Dynasty 25, we know that Kush and Nepta ruled Egypt. And we have the first king who came was Banchi and Taharka and others. Then the, the black kings came to rule Egypt in the late period. They did not have anything to do with this great civilization, such as building tombs and temples and pyramids. If you look at the Meroitic pyramids that built in Sudan, it's not like the great pyramids that built in Egypt. Then we have to know that the black civilization, its origin was in Sudan and Nubia. And I would like to mention here, there are some people who tried to, to show that the origin of Egyptian is black. For example, uh, we have two people from Brazilian came to the Civilization Museum and they took a photograph of a skeleton that was found in a small village near Sohag in Upper Egypt. 33,000 years old skeleton, which I had uh, the opportunity to, uh, to see the scan uh, uh, as well. He worked in quarries and we can tell that from the changes that his work caused on his uh, his elbows as well as in his knees and the and and, and patella. These are of the oldest skeletons in Africa. This two Brazilian took photographs of the skeleton, and they went to Brazil and produced a false scenario that this skeleton was black. How can anyone on earth? It's not scientific. Find out if this skeleton can be black or white. Mm -hmm. Also. When I was visiting uh, Brazil, they do every year a parade. In this parade, it's celebrating that they are the origin of the ancient Egyptians. But that's not true. Again, the black Kushite and the people in the south ruled Egypt in the late period, which is Dynasty uh, 25. I remember when I went to, to give a talk in Philadelphia, and I did say what I'm saying now. Many blacks were very upset with me and they had a march against me. Again, I am not saying at all. I'm not against the black at all. But most of my good friends are really black. But I won't hear to say the truth that Kiribatra was not black. Según todos los vestigios arqueológicos, Cleopatra era de la raza caucásica. Tenemos las pinturas, los relieves, las estatuas de la gran reina de Egipto, Cleopatra. Todos confirman que Cleopatra fue de la raza caucásica. Con todo el respeto a la raza africana, Cleopatra no era africana. Cleopatra era caucásica. Y para dejarlo más claro, la raza caucásica es la raza que habita el norte de África, el sur de Europa. Cleopatra Lo era. Cleopatra era de Macedonia originalmente y nació en Egipto. De nuevo, según todos los vestigios, Cleopatra era egipcia. Era de la raza caucásica del norte África. Coins from her time would show her with typical Greek facial features. Uh, there is a debate over who her mother was. Uh, her mother might have been an, an Egyptian priestess from Alexandria. Here is where the debate comes. Ancient Egyptian does not necessarily mean black. Um, ancient Egyptian society was a multiracial society uh, the same way it is today. We are a multiracial society, excluding Egyptians uh, um, that, that are not of a darker skin tone from their heritage is not okay. And uh, Africa is a huge continent. Africa is a Africa is not all, or, or is not only black. I I'm Egyptian. I'm quite dark, but I have cousins and and family members that look like you. Uh, they have colored eyes and they're white and they're still Egyptian. If we look at the Fayum portraits, for instance, the Fayum portraits for a long time they were thought to belong to uh, Greek uh, inhabitants of Egypt. But recently they did DNA tests on the mummies where these portraits were 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 placed on, and they all turned out to be Egyptian. And uh, Egyptians um, came in all shapes. 
shades and in all colors from very, very dark to very light. And Africa comes in all shades and all colors, cu cu culturally appropriating uh, a civilization or a culture to a certain specific skin color is not acceptable. But they're still African. I'm still African. You are still African, Curtis, because you're South African. Egyptians that are of pale skin are still um, Afri African. Africa is inclusive. Africa is all of us. Um, Egypt is inclusive and referring to a certain civilization or a certain culture as black civilization or black culture, I think this is something to do with Americans' history and not the history of Africa. Africa has always been uh, a multiracial continent and it always will be. Ulatis, who was living in Syria before being recalled back to Egypt and named as Pharaoh, then faced the threat of Roman invasion. He was good friends and allies with Rome, Julius Caesar, and Pompey. He made a trade deal to keep the Romans from invading. A deal that cost one entire year of revenue of the entire Egypt. Naturally, however, this caused the Egyptian people to suffer greatly financially. He was then exiled to Rome taking his daughters, Cleopatra VII, and Arsinoe with him. Ptolemy XII's eldest daughter became Pharaoh. In 55 BC, with assistance from Rome, Ptolemy returned to retake Egypt. He killed his daughter, Berenice IV, and was recrowned as Pharaoh. Two years later, he named his next daughter as co-regent, Cleopatra VII. A year after that, Ptolemy died. Cleopatra was not an Egyptian. Cleopatra was a Ptolemic lady. She was the last ruler of this dynasty. We know that the Greek people lived in Egypt for 300 years, and their role ended on 30 BC. And Cleopatra was the last queen. Cleopatra's father was Ptolemy number 12. And he, when he died, he wrote in his will that Cleopatra and her brother, Ptolemy number 13, should be ruling Egypt. When Cleopatra became co regent with her brother, Ptolemy the 13th, she would have been around 18 years old, and her brother was only 10. She took up the role as dominant ruler, since her brother was way too young to make decisions. We have seen this happen 1,400 years before, during the 18th dynasty, where Hatshepsut took up the role of Pharaoh, since her stepson, Thutmosis, was too young to rule. This was nothing uncommon in Egyptian history. Do you think she had an easy upbringing living with the Ptolemies? No, 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 she did not. I mean, she had, she witnessed her own sister being murdered by her own father. So, no. After her father's death, Cleopatra took over an, an unstable country. She established her own political agenda and strengthened Egypt's economy, producing a wealthy kingdom. Cleopatra was an acute political leader, as well as being a charismatic, brave, and capable ruler for 20 years. Cleopatra began attempts to revitalize Egypt's economy, changing the taxation laws for grain and various other agricultural reforms. She also proceeded forward with the construction of the largest temple at the site of Dendera, on a temple that her father was not able to complete. Dendera Temple is the only intact temple of Cleopatra that we can marvel on today. The most decorated ceiling in all of ancient Egypt is here at Dendera. With the interior painted in a vivid turquoise color, 
the terraced temple, is gloriously decorated and dedicated to the goddess of love and beauty, Hathor. Then, an event occurred that would win over the displeased Egyptian population. The sacred bull in the temple at Hermathis, near Thebes, had died. Cleopatra sailed down from Alexandria to Hermathis with a replacement bull. This event was commemorated on a stela where we see Cleopatra dressed as a male pharaoh and she is seen giving offerings to the bull. Another stela was erected in Fayum by priests, showing Cleopatra dressed in male attire offering to the goddess Isis, a sign that the Egyptians were connecting Cleopatra to Isis more closely. It seems these types of happenings angered Cleopatra's brother and his advisors, and only after one year of co-rulership, Cleopatra is tumultuously chased out of Egypt and fled to Syria. Ptolemy XIII then became a full pharaoh at the age of 12. While living in Syria, Cleopatra garnered up many supporters, and two years later, with her new army, she returned to Egypt to attempt to take back the throne. The plan was flawed. However, the gods were in her favor. General Pompey had fled to Egypt, Julius Caesar followed. Pompey was killed, and Caesar was able to wager some sort of peace between Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy the Thirteenth. Hidden in the desert for a year, she smuggled into the royal palace, while rolled up in a carpet, and was revealed to Julius Caesar, the renowned Roman politician and army general. Cleopatra consulted with Caesar on how she would get the throne of Egypt back. It was during this time that Cleopatra became entangled with Caesar. Their love affair bloomed while they lived together during the backlash from General Pompey's devoted followers, which Caesar eventually defeated from Alexandria. During their stay together, Cleopatra became pregnant. Cleopatra knew that if she became the lover of Julius Caesar and had a child with him, especially a son, this would offer Cleopatra a certain level of protection. So she was very clever in her way of doing these kinds of things. And she knew that Julius Caesar would be less likely to invade Egypt and, you know, conquer Egypt from his love and his son. Yet, Cleopatra was not yet back on the throne. How would she accomplish this? Her sister, who has claimed herself as Pharaoh alongside Ptolemy the Thirteenth, tried to besiege Caesar and Cleopatra. She did manage to regain some power and killed the army general and instated herself as first in command of Egypt, an act that offended Caesar and Cleopatra. Caesar seeking revenge assisted Cleopatra in killing Ptolemy the Thirteenth. It is written that he simply drowned in the Nile, which at that time is simple code for he died. Cleopatra was willing to do anything to retain Egypt. Caesar did have certain ultimatums for Cleopatra. She was to ceremonially marry her next brother, Ptolemy the Fourteenth, who was around 11 years old, but she still retained royal power. This way, there was still a male figurehead, as Romans valued males more. Cleopatra was also ordered 
to pay more tributes to Rome for allowing her family to remain on the throne. After agreeing, she was re-pharaohed. A son was born, Caesarion. Cleopatra then invited Caesar on a cruise down the Nile, where she showed off the beauty of her country and escorted him around Dendera Temple. This would have been where Cleopatra showed off a special scene at the back wall of the temple she was commissioning. The most famous scene of Cleopatra uh, that shown at the entrance of the temple of Dandra, the temple of Goddess Hathar, Goddess of Beauty and Love, it shows her with her son. And here we have the main pharaoh of this temple, Cleopatra the Seventh. With in front of her is Caesar. Next to Caesar is their son, presented as the son of Hathor, since Cleopatra was Hathor Isis on earth. Ibi, the son of Hathor here, is in fact the son of Cleopatra and Caesar, Caesarian. On the opposite wall is Cleopatra shaking a sistrum with a man in front of her who is burning incense to the gods. This man is a representation of what she hoped Caesarian would grow up to be. This is one of the best images that we have of Cleopatra, one of the only remaining images. And above her is her name. On the left, left cartouche actually, spells out the name of Cleopatra. C, L is the lion, E is the reed, O is the, is the rope, Cleo, Cleo, P is the, the box, Cleo, Pa, A is the bird, and then we have hand, and that is actually the D sound, not the T sound. So we have Cleopadra, Cleopadra. So we might actually be pronouncing her name incorrectly. It's not Cleopatra, because clearly written here in hieroglyphs, it is Cleopatra. In 46 BC, Julius Caesar had fully destroyed the followers of General Pompey. Caesar returned to Rome for a lavish celebration where he had a parade of foreign enemies that he defeated. Cleopatra accompanied Caesar to Rome for this event. One enemy of Caesar in particular was paraded through Rome. Cleopatra's sister Arsinoe, who had made moves against Cleopatra, was chained up and humiliated in the parade alongside a scaled replica of the Alexandria Lighthouse where Arsinoe and the army attacked Caesar and Cleopatra. Arsinoe was then exiled to modern-day Turkey. The year 44 BC would mark a major turning point in the life of Cleopatra. On another visit to Rome, Herself, her son Caesarion, and Ptolemy stayed at Caesar's personal villa. We know that she lived in Rome for almost one year with Caesar. The returning presence of Cleopatra with Caesar's son was not welcomed. When Cleopatra arrived in Rome, how do you think she was received in Rome? We know that there was some sort of a big parade happening at her arrival, and uh, we there is a letter from a bystander. He said that he'd never seen dotted camels in his life before, and by dotted camels he meant giraffes. So she had giraffes in her parade. So it, it must have been quite a circus, really. I don't think she was well received uh, by the Senate, that's, that, that, that's for sure. And I don't think she was well received by Julius Caesar's wife either. At the villa, Cleopatra meets the writer, Cicero, who had nothing but bad things to say about the Egyptian female pharaoh. Cicero called Cleopatra arrogant 
And this is where we first hear him name Cleopatra as Caesar's Egyptian whore. The ancient Roman writers really did not like Cleopatra that much. And it's understandable if we think about the times that she was living in. Rome valued men way more than women. So by calling Cleopatra the Egyptian whore, it is an insult to her. They saw Cleopatra as a threat, and that is why they wrote such bad things about her, because they couldn't believe that a woman was in charge of such a rich and abundant country such as Egypt. And so the only way they could justify this was by calling her Caesar's Egyptian whore, the woman that got Caesar to allow her to retain Egypt. So that's really where we get this misconception. Cleopatra had two boyfriends in her, in her entire lifetime. How does that make her a whore? On this visit, Caesar goes as far as to erect a statue of Cleopatra in the Temple of Venus, portraying the queen connected to the Egyptian goddess Isis as Venus herself. Cleopatra is one of the most intriguing historical figures, but sadly her story is one that is written by men, and men that despised her or had their own biases that shaped their narrative of her. She was, after all, considered an enemy of Rome, and those writing about her lived in an empire that was founded on her defeat. So we're left with convoluted versions of who she actually was. It's interesting that her life is depicted to center around two very powerful men. But I'm more interested in the gaps where these two men are not in her life. Was her story there? Because she was so much more than these two men. If we read between the lines, we get glimpses of admiration for her, admiration for her intelligence, her magnetic personality and her charm. That's the part of her life that I'm more interested in. And it's also interesting that even in the modern era, the focus has shifted a lot back onto her looks. What did she look like? Was she beautiful? And in the age of social media and filtered images, what's considered beautiful, the bar has been set so high that it's become unachievable. So I find it really interesting that thousands of years later, we're still talking either about the men in her life or what she looked like rather than her accomplishments. So if we look at writers such as Dio, for example, who was writing in the third century AD, he describes her as stunning in the prime of her youth. So he's ageist as well. And even when he's describing Antony's funeral, again, he's talking about what she looked like. And then we've got Octavian, who in his propaganda describes her as a beautiful witch who cast a spell on Antony, taking away any form of responsibility from Antony. Even the same with Caesar, she's described as using her looks against him. Whereas she was only 21, he was a man in his 50s, a known womanizer lots of experience very powerful so it's interesting that all the blame shifts to her i want to hear the other story of cleopatra i want to read between the lines and know more about her her academia the languages she spoke i want to know more about that part of cleopatra it was on this fateful visit that julius caesar was assassinated on march 15. 44 BC. Cleopatra, who thought that her son Caesarion would be the successor to Julius, stayed in Rome under protection for one more month. The minute she discovered that Julius's cousin was named in his will as successor, Cleopatra, Caesarion, and Ptolemy XIV fled back to Alexandria in Egypt. Not to be outwitted, Cleopatra, shortly after returning home, knew that her then teenaged brother would try to take full control of Egypt and herself 
as was the custom of this complicated family. She poisoned her brother with aconitum, or as we know it, Wolfsbane. Cleopatra, being astute in alchemy and medicines, would have known that lacing food or drink with the root of Wolfsbane would have caused her brother a fast death. Cleopatra and her physician had experimented on criminals with poisons. So she knew that the Wolfsbane would make her brother's tongue swell, his throat close, and paralyze him. He would not be able to call out for help, and there would be no trace of bodily harm. Upon her brother's death, she declared herself and her infant son, Caesarion, as co-rulers over all Egypt. During this time, Cleopatra began to take on the role as reincarnated Isis even more seriously. She had the giant image of Isis carved onto the main pylon at Philae Temple. But in actual fact, the woman standing behind Horus, shown with a fuller face, fuller, fuller body, is actually Cleopatra the Seventh. In accordance with Egyptian mythology, Cleopatra was born of goddess. She was believed to be the human incarnation of Isis, the most powerful female deity of ancient Egypt. The goddess Isis was worshipped by the Greeks and by the Romans as well. Her cult spread throughout the Mediterranean. And here we have the Isis goddess shown as a Greek woman with an Egyptian headdress. The heir of Julius Caesar was a young, unwell boy, Octavian, and thus another Roman was set in charge of the provinces of Rome. He was Mark Antony. Very soon after Cleopatra's return to Alexandria, Octavian had asked Cleopatra to send aid for his war against the assassins of Caesar. Cleopatra, in turn, not wanting to cause issue with Rome, accompanied a fleet of her ships and soldiers to Greece, but arrived too late to assist in the fighting. I really believe that uh, Cleopatra tried to have Octavius on her side. By 42 BC, Mark Anthony defeated the troops of Caesar's assassins. Octavian was in control of the Western Empire, Mark Anthony, his nemesis, in control of the East. Mark Anthony summoned her to come to Turkey so that they could discuss the future of Egypt within Rome. He also wanted to confront her about her assistance towards Octavian. This notion of Octavian would have frightened the Queen immensely. Cleopatra delayed her leaving to Turkey as she had a tactic. She wanted to increase the anticipation of Mark Anthony. Eventually, she set sail for Turkey. Cleopatra arrived on her mythical barge and was dressed in full Egyptian goddess regalia. Her plan to impress Mark Anthony had worked. She had him in her hand. By having Mark on her side, he changed her status from a protected province to an independent monarchy. Abandoning his own wife in Rome and totally besotted with Cleopatra, Mark Anthony goes back to Alexandria with his new love. It is there in Alexandria that Cleopatra goes above and beyond to keep Mark Anthony impressed. She threw lavish feasts and debaucherous parties, some that went on for days. At these events, Cleopatra would appease the patron god of Mark Anthony, Dionysus. In 40 BC, Cleopatra gave birth to twins, 
she named these children of Mark Anthony as Alexander Helios, their son, and Cleopatra Selene, their daughter. Soon after, Mark was summoned back to Rome to make new ties with Octavian. He was to marry Octavian's sister, remaining in Rome for three more years. Conflicts between Octavian and Mark Anthony rose to a pinnacle. Mark Anthony left Rome and returned back to Cleopatra. He asked Cleopatra to fund his campaigns against Octavian and the East. Surely not impressed with the return of the father of her children who had gotten married while away in Rome. Cleopatra agreed, however, she did have terms. She wanted to make sure that Syria and Lebanon were given back to Egypt. She also wanted the assurance that her disgraced and exiled sister, Arsinoe, would be executed. The war against Octavian was retracted. His sister had died, and this caused a temporary peace between Octavian and Mark Anthony. Other wars were still on the go. Cleopatra accompanied Mark on a campaign against the Parthians. After many weeks making it to the border of the Euphrates River, Cleopatra was advised to return back to Egypt. She was now pregnant again, and in 36 BC, she gave birth to another son by Mark Anthony, named Ptolemy Philadelphus. In our modern view, some of the actions of Cleopatra could be seen as a political maneuvers rather than mere seduction. And I'm talking about her establishing relationship with Roman leaders, Caesar and Mark Antony. And this was to keep the independence of Egypt. Mark Antony's battle against the Parthians was a disaster. They lost the battle. He retreated to Beirut. Cleopatra traveled north to meet with him and his troops. She advised him that it would not be wise to return to Rome after such a defeat. He returned with Cleopatra to Alexandria, where he met his new son. Cleopatra and Mark Anthony had big plans together to rule their known world. They had asked the king of Armenia to marry their son, Alexander Helios, to the Armenian princess. The king of Armenia refused, and thus Mark Anthony set off for Armenia with his troops and conquered them as an act of revenge. When he returned to Egypt, the couple had a large public parade. Mark paraded the prisoners of war to Cleopatra. It was written that at this event, Cleopatra was dressed in the guise of Isis. She is said to have declared that she was Queen of Kings and that Caesarion was King of Kings. She even proclaimed her infant son as King of their Armenia. It was at this event where they publicly announced their future plans. Cleopatra, also wanting to stamp her permanent mark, ordered new currency to be minted. Several coins showing the queen were created. These coins showed her in profile, wearing a Greek diadem and her hair in a Greek-styled bun. Some coins had Anthony on the reverse, and some even had their children depicted. Cleopatra even had a large granite stela placed at Karnak Temple, the holiest site of Egypt. The stela shows Cleopatra and Caesarion making offerings to the patron gods of Thebes, Montu, the god of war, and the almighty god of gods, Amu. It wasn't long 
before the news reached Octavian about the announcements of Cleopatra and Mark Anthony. Octavian publicly stated that Cleopatra had bewitched Mark Anthony using her magic of Isis, that Mark Anthony had illegally detained the king of Armenia, and that he had stolen books to stock the library of Alexandria, and that this marriage to Cleopatra was unlawful since he was married still to Octavian's sister. The final straw was when Octavian made a claim that Mark Anthony wanted to conquer Rome and move the capital to Alexandria. The Roman Senate finally declares outright war against Cleopatra, resulting in a devastating naval battle. One item can bring us closer to Cleopatra than any other. It demonstrates her deep knowledge for diplomacy. A papyrus from approximately 33 BC, Cleopatra signs a tax exemption for a man living in Alexandria. This man is a chief army commander and a financial backer of Mark Anthony. By signing this tax exemption, Cleopatra knew that it was a good move because this man was somebody she wanted to keep on sides. Cleopatra approves the tax exemption and signs it in her own handwriting, stating, Let it be done. In the late period, the priests had raised their power once again and increased their taxes. It was here at Kasir Karun that some of this drama played out. Going up the many flights of stairs, we enter an area once reserved only for priests and royals. And when you come onto the roof of this temple, it's one of the very few temples where the roof is still fully intact. When you walk out here, you can see the settlements around, the Roman baths that were built, the houses where the priests and the farmers from the area that fed this temple would have lived. And I can just imagine when there was the strike happening just before Cleopatra died, people coming here complaining to the temple, where's our grain? And the priest who would have been too scared to go downstairs because he might have been taken out, would have stood up here, spoken to the people. Your grain is on the way. We're waiting for the taxes. You haven't worshiped the gods justly, making all of these assumptions to the people why they were not receiving their food. It is amazing that Cleopatra is able to remain in power for 19 years, although in her time there are droughts in Egypt and hunger prevails between the people. She has to open the silos for the people to find enough corn to eat. Almost instantly, upon hearing that Rome has now officially declared war with Egypt, Cleopatra and Mark Anthony went to Greece to seek counsel and aid in 31 BC. Many foreign kings agreed to assist Cleopatra, yet some, who were once allies, turned their backs in fear of Octavian. Mark and his men urged Cleopatra to go back to Egypt. She insisted on staying for the war. Cleopatra stated that she would rather tackle Octavian's troops in Greece as a way to block him from arriving in Egypt. On September the 2nd, 31 BC, the naval forces of Egypt faced Rome in Greece at Actium. Cleopatra and Mark Anthony led 60 ships towards those of Octavian. However, the battle was unsuccessful for Cleopatra. During the battle, many Egyptian and the Allied ships were destroyed. Cleopatra and Mark Anthony fled the scene while the battle was still taking place. 
This caused many of the Allied ships to surrender. The battle had caused much embarrassment on the part of Mark Anthony. He reportedly did not speak to Cleopatra for the next three days on their fleeing voyage. They arrived back in Egypt, not at Alexandria, but at a bay just out of the region. Anthony boarded a ship and went to Cyrene in Greece, while Cleopatra returned to Alexandria. Cleopatra was now trying to make plans to save Egypt, but many allies that she had reached out to turned away from her and sided with Octavian after learning of the Battle of Actium. Cleopatra is suggested to have began plans to retire to a foreign land and install her son, Caesarion, as full pharaoh. She did in fact have a stela erected of her son Caesarion, showing him dressed as a full Egyptian before he was even crowned. This was in about January 30 BC. The stela shows Caesarion making offerings to Atum, the creator god, the crocodile god Sobek, the fertility god Min, and of course, Isis. The cartouches are empty, showing that Caesarion had not yet been crowned as pharaoh, yet the text below mentions Cleopatra and her son, and this was placed at the center of religion in Egypt at Karnak Temple. Cleopatra made attempts to plead with Octavian. She wrote to him and asked that Mark Anthony be exiled from Rome to Egypt and that her children remain in control of Egypt in exchange of yearly payments to Rome. In her letter, she said that if her requests were not met, that she would burn herself and the promised treasures in her tomb. After months of negotiating that led nowhere, Octavian set out to invade Egypt. He attacked Mark Anthony and his troops in Cyrene, defeating them. Mark Anthony made a hastened journey back to Egypt. In 30 BC, in August, Octavian and his army attacked Alexandria. Mark Anthony defended the city, resulting in Octavian's men withdrawing for a few hours. It was then that Mark Anthony received news that Cleopatra was dead. Devastated and not seeing a way out of this mess without Cleopatra, he stabbed himself in the stomach to commit suicide. However, this news of Cleopatra being dead was not true. It was a ploy. According to the accounts of Plutarch, Mark Anthony's men were able to stabilize him and take him to Cleopatra. At her tomb, he was able to speak to her, stating that she can trust Proculius. Mark Anthony then died, aged 53. Others suggest he was already dead when taken to Cleopatra. The queen, who was about to set light to the tomb, was interrupted by Proculius, who demanded to take her to the palace to meet with Octavian. She pleaded to bury Mark Anthony. He allowed her to wrap him as a mummy and laid him to rest inside her own tomb. Cleopatra was presented before Octavian, who had seized her three young children. The Roman historian Livy states that Octavian had agreed not to kill Cleopatra but made no promise of not being taken to Rome. He quotes Cleopatra as shouting out, I will not be led in a Roman triumph. Cleopatra had seen her sister humiliated in the Roman parade, and she had no intention of becoming that. But it was Octavius' dream that he, he should take Cleopatra as a prisoner to show in front of all the people in Rome, the lady, that she captured the hearts of Caesar and Mark Antony. Finally, on the 10th of August, 30 BC, 
seeing no way out, no way to save Egypt, nor herself, Cleopatra kills herself at 39 years old. The death of Cleopatra is controversial. Many say she killed herself in her tomb. Many say she killed herself while imprisoned in the palace. What we do know is that she was accompanied by two ladies in waiting who eventually killed themselves as well. The myth goes that she had an Egyptian cobra bite her breast and that is how she died. This theory has many holes in it. If she was in a rush to go to her tomb to kill herself, how did they get the time to get a snake? If the snake was delivered in a fruit bowl or a jug, the snake would have been visible and the snake would have not had enough venom to kill Cleopatra and the two ladies in waiting. Her body has never been discovered, so we have to rely on ancient sources to formulate a theory of what happened to her. The earliest account is by Greek historian Strabo. He tells us two different accounts. He tells us either she died of snake venom or a poisonous ointment. Then we have Greek physician Galen. He tells us that she bit rum and then poured venom over it. And then we have Dio, who is writing a substantial length after she died. He tells us that she had two slight prick marks on her arms, thereby implicating a snake. But the most famous account by far is that by Plutarch. Now, I think the reason why his account is so famous because he says that his source is Cleopatra's physician, Olympus. But it's difficult to know which part is by Olympus and where it becomes Plutarch's imagination. We don't actually have any writings by Olympus to go on, so we have to take his word for it. But what he tells us is that um, a person married the snake in a basket full of figs and the snake was concealed under some leaves and then Cleopatra took the snake, put it on her arm and let it bite her and this is what killed her and her handmaidens as well. It's very tricky with his explanation because the actual cobra in question is way too large to conceal in a basket of figs. And also the other problem with this theory is that snakes don't always like to release their venom. Most of their bites are dry bites, so there's only about 10% chance of having a venomous bite. His theory just begins to crumble when you look at it in a little bit more detail. It's also interesting that he doesn't discuss the marks or any sort of... He, he tells us that she looked flawless. Some Egyptologists say that Cleopatra killing herself with a snake allowing it to bite her was seen as a noble death. Well, maybe to the Greeks, being killed by a snake or committing suicide was a noble death. However, Cleopatra, who aligned herself with the beliefs of the ancient Egyptians, would have known that committing suicide or being bitten by a snake that you inflict upon yourself was a common sentence for convicted criminals. Surely a woman who was filled with pride of her ancient Egyptian belief system would not have taken the route to have herself bitten by a snake committing suicide. She would have known that this was not a noble Egyptian way to die. Other sources like Galen mention a mark on the upper arm. Cleopatra's physician offers us a clearer and more reliable verdict on her death. Upon finding and examining the queen, he notes it was snake venom. Cleopatra, being well versed in the study of medicines and poisons, would have known that pouring a small amount of poison into an open cut would be enough to kill herself. So there's a few theories of how she could have actually died. One of them is that she swallowed some poison, most likely hemlock, 
and some wolfsbane. Now, the problem with this theory is that none of the sources actually say that she ingested, that she swallowed any poison. All of them refer to poison going straight into her bloodstream, so injecting the poison. And there would have been at least one source that would have said this, so like, it looks very unlikely. And also, drinking poison would have been excruciatingly painful. Hemlock can cause awful convulsions as well. So would she want to inflict that kind of pain on herself? The other thing we have to remember is that it, Plutarch tells us that Cleopatra experimented with poisons because she wanted to find the one that inflicts the least pain. She's accused of carrying out these experiments on condemned prisoners. I think she cut herself and probably poured snake venom onto the wound and this would have killed her with relatively quick speed and through respiratory failure. So this is probably the most plausible explanation because extracted snake venom stays lethal for quite a considerable length of time. When she hears the Roman will uh, offend her in front of her nation in Alexandria, she committed suicide by Cobra rather than to be offended on, uh, in, uh, in front of her nation. So who can take this decision? Only a strong personality who can do this decision to commit suicide to keep her dignity protected. So uh, a lot of respect and love to Cleopatra. The tale of Cleopatra, including the political tactics, the, her love life, and even the mysterious death by a, a Egyptian cobra bite, this all spread throughout the world and it helped to inspire poems, uh, art, and plays like William Shakespeare and Egyptian Ahmed Shawi, and even several uh, Hollywood uh, movies. So actually, even before, long before the Tut al uh, discovery, Cleopatra, she was actually the uh, source of uh, uh, Egypt to Mania and uh, of the world looking to Egypt. Very different to the pharaonic ancient Egyptian history, the history of the Ptolemies in Egypt is very well documented by the Greek and Roman historians of that time. In the Islamic world, El Masudi in the 10th century writes that Cleopatra was amongst scholars. Arab sources reveal that her knowledge of philosophy, law, history, culture, the arts, alchemy, medicine, and religion were vast. These sources also show Cleopatra to be an extraordinary and devout ruler, the author of several books in medicine and alchemy. When Octavian saw Cleopatra dead, although enraged, he did allow Cleopatra to be embalmed and buried in her tomb alongside Mark Anthony. This too is disputed. Do you think that Octavian would have really afforded her a royal burial? I, I doubt it because we know that, that, that Octavian or Augustus as he will later on be referred to cleared all of uh, Cleopatra's treasures and took them back with him to Rome. So. Uh, even if he did bury her, it would have not been a royal burial. He, he was not going to let her uh, get buried with uh, tons and tons of gold. We know it is recorded that he left Alexandria with all of her treasures and all of her money. I was involved in the search of the tomb of Cleopatra for about 12 years. I did uh, join Catherine Martinez and we worked together inside a temple called Tabo Osiris Magna. That temple is located west of Alexandria. And Catherine thought that Cleopatra and Mark Antony could be buried there. We started our excavation. We discovered many statues of Ptolemaic and also coins of Cleopatra and faces of Cleopatra. And the most important face that we found 
It's a beautiful alabaster face. Show Cleopatra as a very white woman. We also working outside the temple of Tabo Zeris Magna, and we discovered a big, large cemetery. I really do not believe that Cleopatra was actually buried uh, in this temple, but maybe she used this temple because this temple in Tabo Zeris Magna was built for the goddess Isis, and maybe Cleopatra connected herself with Isis, then maybe she could be visiting the temple. And this is why we have statues of many other Ptolemaic kings and also for Cleopatra. And yeah. even we have evidence that this temple was built by Ptolemais number uh, five. One of the most intriguing queens and celebrities figure. This is the reason why I've been searching for Cleopatra's tomb. I believe she deserved to be found. I came out with a theory that Queen Cleopatra could be buried in a location 45 kilometers west of Alexandria, Taposiris Magna. I believe it could represent an important meaning for Queen Cleopatra, since she portrayed herself as goddess Isis, and Mark Anthony used to dress as a representation of Osiris. And I believe, even though the location has never been even considered before, important objects have been discovered so far that link the temple to Queen Cleopatra. And I believe if there's any place that reunite all the conditions to be the final resting place of Queen Cleopatra, it will be Taposiris Magna. We have a palace for Cleopatra. And this palace is located under the water now. And we know from historical facts that Cleopatra built a tomb for herself next door to this palace. Then maybe Cleopatra was buried inside this tomb. When I did my famous uh, TV series, It's Chasing Mummies, I did go and I began to take some pillars from uh, the palace of Cleopatra. Then we know that Cleopatra built a palace there. Cleopatra did manage to send her son Caesarion away down south to Nubia en route to Ethiopia. While traveling, his mother died. Then Caesarion legally became Pharaoh, but only for around 18 days before he was captured by Octavian's men and executed on the Romans' orders. Cleopatra's three remaining children were eventually taken to Rome. They were paraded as prisoners. Her two sons would disappear, and her daughter was married off to an ally of Rome in Mauritania. She was queen of that land for quite some time, and requested many of her mother's scribes and scholars be sent to her. She had a son named Ptolemy, who went on to rule Mauritania for a short time before being executed by Caligula in 40 AD and thus completely ending the Ptolemaic bloodline. Cleopatra's legacy lives on today, but let's try and look past the myth and focus on who she really was. A woman, a sister, a mother, a fighter, a queen, a pharaoh. Thank you.